Okay. So you say knowledge. Yeah. Cool. That's my favorite part. Yeah, right? <laughs> that was a pretty uncreative clap that time. Here we go. Sound pop. Right. <laughs> that one was also way, louder way, than the way first Way worse. One. <laughs> Oh, man. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hey guys, what's going on? Modern Man Sit Down. This is the second time we're doing this. If you didn't catch the first one, you definitely want to check that one out. Now, we sat down, we talked about what it meant to be the modern man. And we put out a lot of questions out there. And the main thing is we don't know the answers. The first step is having a conversation. So with me today, Jonathan Parker, Tyler Harris, Charles Russ, and we're going to continue this conversation in terms of the modern man. One question that we put out there is how men can kind of find other men, men groups. Jonathan Parker today joining us. We know you're, you're a master of conversations. First and That's foremost. That's what you say, a master of man groups. I was man groups. <laughs> I just like, I mean, building that resume of mastership. Yeah, master of, uh, of everything conversations. But I guess the main question we always talk about is, you know, how do we start that conversation with other men? How can we break out of our comfort zone and, and meet men to kind of roll with. Yeah. So I, actually, can I ask a question? Sure. Before I answer the question? So I want you to think about the, the best relationship you have with another guy. Mm -hmm. What drew you to that relationship? Hmm. I'd say similarities. Similarities? OK. Yeah. Like one specifically or broad? Uh, broadly. OK. Uh, I think similarity is comfort. And at, at some point in time, it's almost like when you share what you're thinking and it's accepted, right. it's comfortable. Yeah. So you kind of tend to do that more. Okay, good. All right, good. Similarities, broad, what else? I think uh, people that you've gone through some stuff with. Okay, experience. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and does it have to be, it doesn't have to be, po does it have to be negative or can it be positive? Either, yeah, okay. both. Good both. Or yeah. Good? Yeah. Good. yeah. Kind of hit it on the head, um, the similarities, the combination of the similarities, I think that leads to what Tyler said. If you have the similarities, you feel it out for a little while, and then you go through something. Be it a positive, we created something, a business venture, something positive, or just something negative you were going through or they were going through, and they helped you through it, and you're just like, that's, that's my guy. That's your guy. And I think all of you touched on something that I think matters when it comes to men connecting with other men, especially in a conversation. So I always say that all of us have two deep desires, right? The opportunity to communicate and respect to be heard. Everybody, no matter the age, the gender, the generation, your background, everyone wants the opportunity to communicate and the respect to be heard. And most people are lacking in those things. Most people don't get enough of that. Um, they're either they're either hungry for it, you know, they're famished, right? They're or malnourished because they haven't had it for so long. But people are always looking for that. And those two things, and something I don't touch on a lot, but in this setting it's perfect for guys, because those two things are weaknesses as well as desires. Hmm. Like when I don't have the opportunity to communicate, when I don't have someone to give me the respect to be heard, it moves into a weakness. I feel less powerful, and then I overcompensate by doing something else. Hmm. Saying things like, I don't need you. I don't need people in my life. I don't need to have a conversation. I can overcome this. And in a, a pretty dominated world of just get over it, pull yourself up, tough through it, those, those also affect our weaknesses or our missing fulfilled desires. And what you all touched on was you had similarities. You had, you know, you went through something, you built businesses, you had you had the opportunity to, to communicate respect to be heard, and that's what drew you together. But what also drew you together was you found out that you could be real with that guy. That you could admit, I'm lacking something. I'm lacking something. And in the men's group that I, that I run, Gospel on Tap, we always start the day by letting guys talk. Because at the end of the day, it's what they want. They want the opportunity to communicate, and then they got five other guys around the table giving them the respect to be heard. So just acknowledging that, yes, this is, this is a desire and it demonstrates a weakness, like I'm lacking something, but guys aren't supposed to power through that. They yeah. need to find the guys for them to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would think about it. We can't have the, the doctor of conversation here talking about conversation. We're about to get outclassed. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm here to help. <laughs> My first thing, though, that I would ask you, 
if you don't mind, if you don't mind me asking him a question, Ted, uh, explain for the the people who are watching, man. Like we we've all been blessed to hear you a couple times. Explain to the people watching, like what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, the process, the thoughts, because that that right there will kind of set the stage for us all being down here, like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. So several years ago, I went on a personal journey, which is also something that guys have a hard time admitting to, mm. like the personal journey mm -hmm. of like discovery and development and wanting to be a better person. And I went on this journey specifically around this idea of how I have conversations with people. Because I do believe that conversations are both the most natural thing and unnatural thing you do. So it's natural for you to do. It's almost like breathing. You want to communicate and you want to talk. But it's also unnatural because the culture in which we live in right now has made conversations weird and strange and people get really awkward when they start having conversations. So I went on this personal journey, never expecting to talk about it, never expecting to speak about it, but just wanting to improve my conversations. And over that time, I, I looked at a lot of different programs, a lot of different books, and they're really great. But I didn't like the idea of a package. I didn't like I had to do step one, step two, step three, step four. Four, and then look, I'm this type of conversationalist. I wanted to be me, just the better version of it. So I took the best from everything and learned as much as I could and then realized I need something really practical. I needed a filter that worked every day that was more practical than philosophical, something that, that was uh, something I could implement and not just have to work hard to make it fit my life. So I created not a formula, just I believe that all conversations revolve around curiosity, questions, listening, and sharing. And everything else you do under that falls under one of those categories. And I started to do that and my conversations improved, most specifically listening improved. And as I got to be a better listener, people would ask me, what are you doing? And again, it was slow, you know, nothing happens overnight. Uh, so I was learning and I was growing. And then I was asked to teach it to a group of interns at Fellowship Greenville where I had the privilege to work. And I had two friends in the room and they loved it and they brought me in to teach their staff and that was May 2016. And, and, and just how it's worked out mm -hmm. and how God has chose, seen fit to, to make a move with also hard work and responsibility. I was talking to another guy uh, just a couple days ago. He was like, how did you do this? And I said, well, Hard work, responsibility, <laughs> make good decisions, don't waste time. And the look on his face was like, oh, I, I don't want to do any of that. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. <laughs> I thought there was a pill. So, so just kind of went through it. And now I've had the opportunity to speak on podcasts, keynotes, worked with office training, done some coaching. Um, this isn't huge public knowledge, but might as well drop stuff. Working on a book right now. Nice. Cool. Um, all around helping people be better conversationalists. So it's been fun to take something that was a personal journey for me because it's, it's personal and be able to share it with other people because it comes from a place of like, this is what I do, this is what I live out, this is what I believe. So every other part of what I do all stems to this idea is I believe that if we have better conversations, mm -hmm. everything gets better. Not, I, not one thing, everything gets better. And I think that's interesting with that story because as like a lot of good movements often start with somebody trying to solve something for themselves. And when they solve something for themselves, people asking you to teach it is like, well, hey, there's a demand for this out there. And applying it to the modern man, I think the demand is how we kind of share our emotions and communicate with other people. Uh, I mean, in this, for, for everybody, how do we understand our emotions? Do you, do you have an insight on how we can like understand? Because I think growing up, as men, we're not emotionally taught. Sure. But we're kind of like, I mean, for me it's two. It's like I'm either happy or I'm mad. Mm -hmm. That's it. Is, is emotional education a term? Because if it's not, you should coin it right now. <laughs> right now. Yeah, call it, e, call it EE, emotional education, man. I don't, like, I can even relate, you know. You know I always say like my, one of my biggest things is that I, I, I'm very, self-correcting like I, I I try to look at my faults and sit them right in front of my face and be like how are you gonna fix this that's I like to think that's one of my biggest positives as a person so 
you know, like I have a temper, man, and it's bad. And I know it's bad. You know, it's no, no use to me hiding it. I do have a temper in conversations it comes out, you know, which is why this is a good, great form to say that. Like certain things will just pull it out. And then it, it triggers me into being mad, which inevitably ends, ruins the conversation. You know, so that, so what you're saying is correct. So how do I correct that? Addressing the triggers. I actually had a buddy of mine uh, uh, named Dustin. He was like, man, I'd love to try to identify those triggers with you one day. And that was literally the first time I ever thought about it. Like, yeah, maybe you need to address what does that, you know? And then the, the invasiveness of other emotions other than happiness and anger as a man, the invasiveness of those feelings, it's real awkward. It's very awkward. It's, it's literally like a probe. It's a very uncomfortable moment. She's like, wait, I don't do that. I don't feel that. I don't like it. It's not my, it, this isn't my area. So breaking into those, man, if, if, if you could like, you can't, you'll never pinpoint it because we're all different, but just getting a, a general idea of how to, to go into those, those places with other guys without making them feel violent, literally almost violated. If we could get to there, if, you, if someone could take it there, I think that would be amazing. Well, I think as men, it seems as though we're taught to almost disregard our emotions or at least kind of push them to the side because they're too busy focused on business or hustling and, you know, yeah, hustle. moving forward. This is what it looks like. And it's, it's always pushing the ball down the court and you don't have time to deal with these emotions, good or bad, really. And so it's almost like we've been um, conditioned over time to just kind of let those things fall by the wayside and just focus on what's important to us right now. And I think we have these ideas of certain people that wear their emotions on their, on their chest, like, that's not me, I, I'm not that guy. And it's somewhere trying to figure out that, that sweet, that sweet spot in the middle, I think, um, where you can experience the emotions and use the emotions, uh, but not be on the extreme one way or the other, because I think it's important to be able to experience them and to be able to, um, whether they're negative or positive. Um, but I think it's just, you know, I don't know if it's from our parents' generation and their parents' generation. Like, I don't think of my dad as someone that was super emotional. Like, that's not the one word that I would use to describe him. Uh, so I don't know if that's what kind of, teaches this uh, to us and how we, how we act. Um, but I think it's an, it's an important conversation to have um, because I think that nothing good can come from hiding anything and nothing good can come from um, pushing anything under the rug. Emotions probably are at the top of that list. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an important conversation. The, I, you mentioned something, like we're not educated on our emotions. Yeah. Like at a young age, we're not, we don't know how to, I don't ever remember someone sitting down and going, hey, this is how you process that you're angry or you're sad or you're happy. And I think my wife is doing that with my three sons because I think there's more books about it. Like there's just more like, hey, you need to start teaching your boys younger about their emotions. So when I think about like this idea of emotional education, right, emotional intelligence, how do men how you men do or identify their emotions, I think we know what they are. Mm. I think we know how we feel. I don't know if we look for opportunities to, to actually express those before we vent them. Okay. One way or the other, either with tears or with anger. I mean, I was, I think it was just a couple nights ago, I, I felt a sudden onset of loneliness, which is kind of strange, because I got, house full of people, hmm. we've got a beautiful wife, we've got friends, but there's a sudden onset of, of loneliness. And I thought, how do I deal with this emotion? Well, if I go tell another guy, hey, I'm feeling lonely right now. As a guy, my response would be, you're with me. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've, got, you've got people in your house. <laughs> right. And it's that, I, and, if, and I, I dealt with it, you know. We talk about how I did later, but at the point was, I think it's this idea that men wait too long to voice their emotions, and it comes out in sad, 
depression, tears, mm -hmm. or you know, anger. Um, men know how to celebrate generally right in the moment, so that's not an emotion we struggle to wait on. Like we do something good, we're like, <laughs> let's give ourselves a party. <laughs> but I, I think we know what we feel. Hmm. I still think we look to express them because we just hope we get over. It. Yeah. Hmm. And, and to uh, to Charles's point too, and like with some of us reverting to anger with our emotions, do you think that anger, those triggers, comes from being misunderstood when we try and maybe express our emotions and we're not expressing it accurately and when they're misunderstood, we revert to anger for not being understood, for not trying to express, hey, I'm sad. And then you're in a conversation with somebody who's disregarding your sadness. And then now I'm no longer sad, I'm angry because you don't understand why I'm sad. That was a key word is disregard. I think as men, we feel disregarded. It doesn't matter what it's for. If I'm sad and you disregard it, if I'm getting mad and you disregard it, if I'm trying to celebrate with you and you disregard it, I think we immediately go to that angry place, you know, like it's a joke, but my favorite emoji is that orange frowny angry guy. Like I'll send it with a fist, I'll send it with a bicep, but that's, he's always in there. That's my guy. It's your guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a joke. I feel like we need to walk this out. Maybe we can switch that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe just a frowny face yeah. guy. Like. I'm going to ease it back. I, I, I'm already, work on it. <laughs> I'm already working on it, man. I, I'm working on it though. I, and you know what? I'm going to do a 30 day emoji plan yeah. and ease it back to this guy, right. you know? So, but we do that, man. We do. We, uh, this being disregarded is like one of our, our, I think as a man in general, is we want to be important, especially in our own household. You know, if you ever think your wife or your children, and I, dude, I, I don't know, do you, you have kids? Yeah, three kids. Okay, how, what's your oldest? Uh, there's four, four, three, and two. Okay, so my kids are 15, and they're twins. So it's just a different ball, they, they, and they're, they're the alpha of, of twins. They play football and basketball, you know, and and Ted's met them a million times, they're, they're alpha. And, uh, but to feel disregarded will make me, that, that's one of my, it's like, don't, don't disregard me, I'm your dad. I, I'm, this is my show. And it's, you know, and it's hard, it's hard to deal with. It's hard to rein yourself in, in that moment, rein yourself in, calm yourself down. So we're talking through it now, but there is no talking through it. It's not like they say something I can walk out of the room, sit on the bed, think myself through it, then come back and talk to them. For them, the moment's over. They're like, I said what I said, I'm done. So it's, it's that immediate reaction, I think, is where the worst comes from. Because we're in the worst place. We're back to primal, uh, red level, uh, attack mode. So I feel like, um, you know, even the same thing with you being lonely, you know, you're not lonely physically. Like you're not lonely now, but one of us could literally be lonely if all three of the other people are on a certain page and we're not there. We're not there emotionally. We're not there the way we think. We're not there financially. It's very easy to feel lonely. Like I've been at a table with, with three guys and I'm like, man, all these guys have a net worth that is ridiculous. And I'm over, that's a lonely feeling. You know, the same way as, you know, whatever reason you were feeling lonely, Whatever you were feeling lonely, whatever was making you feel lonely, no one else in close proximity to you was in your area in that specific topic or whatever. And that's the loneliness, you know? It's lonely, I've, I've got a good buddy of mine who said that, you know, who was glad when I moved back because he couldn't hang out with anybody they used to hang out with. Because he did well, he worked hard and he was making money and all of his friends never wanted to do things with him because it's expensive, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. He became lonely. And he's married and has kids, but he was lonely in that aspect. He's like, nobody wants to hang out with me because they think I just want to spend, I just want to hang out with my friends. So, you know, and I think that's a great example of, spatially, I think that's the right word, he was lonely. So I think when you, when you express your emotions, there's a certain level of vulnerability there. And when there's even hesitation, no less disregard, but even just hesitation, like you were saying, it turns that vulnerability into feeling like a weakness. So like, I feel lonely. I'm gonna be vulnerable enough to share this with you. I feel lonely. Even when you just hesitate, like, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to, I don't know how to react to this. I don't know how to respond. Even that hesitation makes me feel like that's a weakness. Yeah. And now that you look at me as 
someone that doesn't have it all figured out. And I think that's, that becomes the issue in, in not wanting to express that vulnerability again with you, because when I expressed it to Ted, he kind of hesitated, made me feel like weakness, made me feel lesser. So now we're having lunch and I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that again because last time it wasn't, didn't, didn't help me very much. I actually felt worse coming out of that conversation than I felt better. So it's like figuring out how to be on that end mm -hmm. of you do come up and, and say, hey man, I'm, just, I'm feeling lonely right now. Like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. And like what that immediate reaction is. Like, I know one of the things that I really got out of your talk uh, GVL Hustle the other night was when you, when you talked about this aspect of asking if they want feedback. Right. Like, do you mind if I give you some feedback on that? He was like, just, just by saying that one little thing opened it up to at least knowing yes or no, like, yes, they are, great, and then you can provide it, or no, they're not, and then cool, let's you know, keep rolling. But I don't know if it's some, probably something to do with that, and, and I'm sure you probably know the answer for sure, because this is your specialty. <laughs> but but what, is, what is it on the receiving end of someone being vulnerable and expressing an emotion to make it to where you can hold that space for them and so that they don't feel, so it doesn't turn into a, a feeling of weakness. Yeah, and I am, I mean, this is something that I've been on both sides of, like confessing an emotion or saying, hey, this is how I feel, and then the guy not responding well, but then also having someone express to me and me responding just like another guy. And here's what it comes down to, we're problem solvers. Mm -hmm. We're not, like, so until, man, you feel only cool, tonight, let's go out. I got five guys, <laughs> let's go. And like, not helpful. Right. <laughs> it's like real hard we say that. Let's go. No, like, and, and the guy, and it's not that he didn't hear me. He, we were just problem solvers. Yeah. We just, we hear emotions like we hear problems. And I do that too because I want to solve the problem. Why? I want to appear strong. Mm -hmm. Where what a guy needs in that moment is for them, for them to hear, yeah, I've been there too. Like, it, like hey man, I'm really battle and anger. I feel like my kids just disrespected me. I could go, well, you know what you need to tell them? They're not eating. Like, I could just do that. And then that's like solving a problem. But what I need to do is go, I've been there too. And then ask questions. Well, how, how do you, how are you, how are you feeling about all that? Not about what are you going to do about all that, right? Because that's our thought. Like, fix it. Hmm. No, no, no. I've been there too. How are you feeling about that? And so we have to, Holding the space is empathy. It's sympathy. It's, it's, as Brene Brown says, it's simply saying, I've been there too. But guys want to be problem solvers. And if guys are having a bad day, being able to fix someone else's problem, that will turn everything around for that. Mm -hmm. And again, it's because we're all looking for this opportunity to communicate and the respect to be heard. So part of holding the space is saying, I've been there too. But Charles, you brought up something that's so key. It's that going back to have a conversation. Men are terrible. I'm awful. My wife wants to go back and talk about something that happened two days ago, and I'm like, who cares? <laughs> what is the purpose of this? It's done. Why? Why is she wanting to bring it back? Because she still has emotions she wants to deal with. She probably doesn't want to talk about the situation anymore. She wants to talk about how she felt during that situation. So for guys, we feel something. Something happens to us. The thought of scheduling a conversation or, well, you know, I know I'm meeting Ted for coffee. I'm going to tell him, like, this is what happened on Sunday and see what he says. Like, we don't think that way. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening, and I talk about this in conversation about this private gallery, the things we tell ourselves. We hit that emotion. It happens privately. We don't want to go back and talk to somebody about it. We don't call somebody about it. So what we tell, what we tell ourselves is, oh, it's not a big deal. We can get there. And that goes on your wall. And another emotion pops up, and you're like, well, how did I deal with the last one? Oh yeah, not a big deal, not a big deal. And next thing you know, you have a bunch of emotions you've never dealt with. And you've, you're out of practice, and go into God and say, hey, let's talk about this. And we were just out of touch. So part of holding space for another guy is making sure that you're being authentic and true and vulnerable to yourself. I got issues, I got emotions, I need to talk about them. I mean, we're all doing something on social media, and I, I mean, I'll just say this for myself. Part of the reason I do it is I got stuff I need to get off. Like I need to say, like I got emotions I need to give to my kids or talk about with leadership. I need, I need to say them and I hope they benefit somebody else, but I need to know other people. I, need, I want other people to know that I'm being honest with myself, that I have emotions and I have 
I have things going on in my life that resonates and empathizes with somebody else, and hopefully that means I can hold space with a guy like that. Ed, he just gave, he just told the Charles Ted how they met story in a very higher level. It was literally for me, and it, I don't want to make it sound like I was being this big heroic guy, but it was literally an empathetic moment. Ted came out, so we were out for uh, someone's birthday. And, and these were people that I knew before Ted, so I'm out with them, we're having a good time. Ted was the weekend weather guy at that point, so he didn't get off until like 11 o'clock and I was new. I didn't know anybody, so I came out to meet with some coworkers. And you got there about 12, 12 maybe, if we're lucky it was 12. And you're midnight, right? We're not talking midnight. Yeah. Time. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 12 o'clock. Everything closed at two. He walks in, they all say, hey, we're gonna call it night, we're gonna leave. And I saw him walk in and he, and I literally heard him say, I, but I just, I just got here. <laughs> and this was my, my, my empathetic moment and it led to a friendship. I mean, it was, and it was, and it was very, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a big deal at the time. I didn't think about it, it wasn't, but it was an empathetic moment in that I said, man, y'all gonna leave this dude here by himself? And I'd only been back in Greenville about a year. I mean, it wasn't like I was everywhere. I said, you know what, man? I'll stay with you. I don't know where they're going. I don't know what they're doing. I'm not ready to go. I'll stay with you. He's like, you sure? I was like, yeah. And we hung out till the place closed, exchanged phone numbers. We exchanged phone numbers and he leans in and goes, you know, you're stuck with me now, right? <laughs> and, and it was prophetic. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. He's gotta put me on his podcast. He's gotta take me with him when he goes places. So Ted, what do you think? How do you identify emotions like? Um. So that's the, the biggest thing, I'll be honest, in terms of I've been working on is trying to ask myself why I'm feeling something. And I'm at the point now where I try and understand why I'm feeling something before I talk about it. Before I address like, hey, such and such happened, I wanna know why I'm feeling something. Because a lot of times, I know for me, I might jump to conclusions. Somebody might say something that I might interpret the wrong way. And the reality of it might be, okay, they had my best interest at heart, but I'm being emotional and I'm taking it the wrong way and I'm wanting to jump to one conclusion. So for me, I try and slow down and not react right away. Um, does it always work? Absolutely not, <laughs> absolutely not. But I think asking myself why I'm feeling it and I think you hit the nail on the head is kind of putting the mirror up and accepting your own emotions. Even when it doesn't work and I express myself, I still leave that possibility open that I can be wrong here. I can be wrong in this exchange and I might be angry and going back and forth, having the ability to kind of like stop and be like, maybe I'm wrong. But if I am wrong, it's almost like I want the, I want the ability to be wrong. Like I want to be forgiven for being wrong. Mm. We all get emotional and we all kind of overreact. And I don't want that to be an issue because now I'm no longer, and I'm a very stubborn guy, I'm no longer fighting for how I feel, I'm fighting for the right to feel how I felt. Mm -hmm. So I think when, I, when we talk about like that emotion and, and understanding it, I know I don't understand my emotions when we first start. I don't understand my emotions immediately, but when I, I like to think out loud. When I think out loud, I think that's being vulnerable. And after thinking out loud, when I make the conclusion, you know, I don't want the previous thought, the wrong thoughts, to be what I'm judged for, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, back to what John was saying about, um, did you call it the personal gallery? Private mm -hmm. gallery. Private gallery. Private, private gallery. Private gallery. Private so, so what happens is we, we have these emotions, we put them in our little private gallery. And then all of a sudden, when we do have a real conversation with someone, I'm like thinking of uh, like Anchorman when he's in that, that to uh, phone booth. And he's like, I'm in a glass case of emotion. <laughs> like it's like when you finally do have someone that's like willing to have that real conversation with you, you're like, Bleh. <laughs> like I'm just gonna get rid of all this that I've been sewed up for six months yeah. um, because I'm not handling it one, one situation at a time. And so I think that's, <laughs> that's gotta be key is to be able to handle those emotions when they come so that when you do get all of a sudden the opportunity to, to really have a, a conversation about what's going on that you don't all of a sudden just overwhelm somebody. And then there is gonna be hesitation mm -hmm. if you all of a sudden dump like, I'm lonely, I also think I'm depressed. Also, 
my wife and I are just not sure, and my kids hate me, and all of a sudden you're like, oh God, like well, I got, I need a second to, <laughs> to, to take to process this, and then you got that hesitation, which feels like weakness, and then it's just like, it's a bad cycle, it's a real bad cycle. So I thought, man, like y'all are talking about it, man, but it's literally like if you're a guy and you're watching this, as I look directly into the camera, if another guy comes to you, dude, they just accept it. It's not, it's not this old adage of men, we handle everything. And we still can. I'm sure all of you guys, I can. But that's probably not the healthiest way, most productive way. You know, like I know your core four is your, is your bread and butter and it's, it's extremely correct. So I'm trying to keep part of my core four together. And that will help me in every other area. If you want to be productive, if you want to do all this and you're emotionally distraught, you're going to wreck everything. So that's, that's just part of it. So if another guy, and I think it, it's, it's a double-edged sword, uh, I can't be afraid to share. But we can't just walk around sharing, 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 sharing. We have to be, a, we have to be open to another guy saying, hey, but I'm like depressed. And not looking at him like, quit being a punk, get it together, let's go. You know, try and, and hone in kind of wrapping up here and maybe try and provide some kind of solution or, or steps towards a solution. I think we talked a lot about emotions, understanding our emotions, being vulnerable to share them with other men and having those conversations. Do you think maybe uh, a brief before that conversation, kind of like a warning to another man, if, if we're all hanging out and I come, I say, hey guys, can I have permission to just share something with you guys, I need you. Will that kind of prep the environment and also prep the other person with, okay, what this person's about to tell me isn't something I could just brush off and you know, respond and solve it like a man. This is someone prepping me like, hey, I'm about to be vulnerable. Can we have permission to get into that space? So, yes. So let me say yes, hold it here for a minute and then circle back to it. I think part of the reason we have to ask permission to share our emotions, even though I agree with the idea, is because it's not part of our normal routine, which is why people look at us funny when we do share them. Like that, when someone sits down in the, the glass box of emotions, the guy's like, who are you? We've been hanging out for six months and none of this has come up. And then that guy almost feels not disregarded, but maybe devalued. Like you didn't trust me enough to share this with me a month ago, but now you dump all of this on me? Like what else have you been hiding from me? It's like Mark Twain's quote, if you tell the truth, you never have to worry about what you say. So part of the reason that if you're dealing with something emotionally, you need to say it right off the bat is because that's who you are. So the person you're hanging around with isn't shocked when you say, hey man, I just had a bad day. I got to lay it out. Like, the permission's okay, like setting the context, but generally you have to set the context for something like that when it's not normally part of your life. So I think sitting down with a group of guys and saying, hey, listen, I, do I have your permission? Or hey, you mind if I go first for the next 10 minutes? I gotta just get something out there and I need, and I'm not just putting it out there because I need to get it off my chest. I'm putting it out there because I need you to invest in me. I think that's, I think that needs to happen to at least one guy every time you're out. If you're hanging out with four guys, you're gonna to try to tell me all four guys, everything's working out, job's good, family's good, career's good. I mean, out of four guys, somebody's having a hard time. Um, so I've only done this once, I haven't done it in a while. It was more of a test. I didn't tell my friends I was testing them. Um, but I just said, hey, listen, I wanna have, have an intentional conversation. We're only together for an hour and a half. It was, you know, end of the day. And I said, who's ever in the most pain gets to talk first. And the first person went, that's me. Like he self-identified, he knew what he was dealing with, whether he was right or wrong. But the moment I said, hey, whoever's hurting the most gets to go first. Wow. The guy's like, yeah, I, I need to. And I think leaders, men and women, but men specifically, they need to lead in this conversation. So if you're hanging out with four guys, don't wait for somebody to ask. Just say, hey, listen, I know things aren't perfect, so who's ever, whoever hurts the most gets to go first. And that person, will, that person will go, all right, I'll, I'll go. And then the response to that table, don't problem solve. Empathize, feel with that person, ask them how they're feeling. Um, lead in that regard um, on a more no normal basis, and then you won't have to get to the place where you have to set the context. 
Because you're just going to be like you. This is part of your life. I feel like the key, I've been in a situation before where, where people have just asked me something like, hey man, what's, uh, what's something going on in your life right now I can pray for you about? And it's just like it opens, it like immediately opens up to where you're like, cool, like he just ripped the vulnerability out of me and here it comes. And so maybe that's the key. Maybe it's like some key phrases on the other person's end, the person that's doing okay or not, but to be able to start those conversations by saying like, hey man, like what are you, what are you battling with these days? Like what's going on? Like I think feels more organic to me than someone saying like, hey, you guys mind if we talk about some, some serious stuff right now? To be the person that says like, hey, like I know someone, you know, one of you guys is probably going through some, through some stuff right now. Like, like who is it? Like, like let's talk about it. And having it come from that direction, it's like, permission is granted and you don't feel that 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 level of weakness to the vulnerability like oh i'm the weakest one in the group that has this thing going on that i'm about to have to bring up like someone else makes it okay to voice those things to me that would be those situations that i've been in had that person not opened the floor up for someone to be vulnerable it would have never gotten there just naturally. Uh, but I think there's something to all this in, in regards to like law of attraction. Cause like I was so focused for so long on this idea of law of attraction and just like fleeing from negativity that I just didn't want to talk about negative things. Like if all of a sudden you're like, Hey man, let me, let me uh, I really need to talk to you about some stuff. And all of a sudden it's like a bunch of freaking negative stuff. Like part of me, like literally was like teaching myself to like completely disregard that. Cause like, I don't want that. I don't need, I don't need that energy yeah. like I don't need that negative energy in my life like I'm trying to focus on only things that are positive and and keep moving forward and so I think a lot of it was like it's basically it's like kind of destroying that idea of saying like there's 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 certain areas where dealing with negative thoughts and dealing with these the negative emotions and obviously these conversations tend to lean towards talking about negative emotions but they can be the other way as well. Uh, but it's almost making it like, okay, like to have those conversations as though somehow you can actually have something positive come out of talking about something negative, right. I guess. Yep. Um, and making sure that you, you're understanding of that. But, but maybe as far as a solution, because I think we can sit here and talk about the problem all day, but as far as the solution may be on the other end of like, hey, every time you're with a friend that you haven't seen in a little while, like asking some of those questions to dig some of the real stuff out yourself even if you're the one that comes into that conversation knowing that you need to get some stuff out. Because the reality is we've all got stuff. Like every single person that's watching this, every single person sitting here has all got something that if we said, okay, every single person open up right now, be vulnerable, what's pain, boom, go, boom, go, boom, go. We all got it. And so if you understand that, just like starting to maybe open up in those conversations with other people, it's like almost the do unto others as you want done to yourself. That whole idea of like, I'm gonna give this person an opportunity to be vulnerable with me, and in turn, they probably are gonna allow me to open up and. Can I share one of my favorite conversational tools? Please, yeah. So one of the things I think makes conversations like this work is when everybody knows that they're gonna answer the same questions. So I have five questions that I use at Gospel on Tap that I use in most conversations um, that I think if, if guys were to say, hey, I want to do, you know, they're watching Modern Man, they're like, I want to do that with my friends. We just don't know where to start. Or, hey, I want to do that next time I'm at coffee or next time I'm at happy hour or dinner, but I just don't know where to start. Everyone, if you just have everyone go around in the circle and answer these five questions, you'll be blown away with what's shared. And those questions are high, low, learn, felt, ask. What's the high of your week? What's the high since we last met? What's the lows? What has been the lowest points? What are you learning right now? It's the biggest thing you're learning. How are you feeling right now? And ask, what's the biggest question just looming over your head? I mean, you, and then every guy's like, so if, if we, rather than, not rather than, in addition to say, hey everyone, let's just be open and vulnerable. Guys are like, uh, okay, um, where do, like work, like where do you want me to start? But if, but if guys know, everyone's answering these five questions. Everyone's gonna be on the same page. 
then they're going to be able to explore the highs, the lows, what they're learning, how they're feeling, and ask like, Ben, what's, what's the question over your head? I don't know if I'm going to have a job next week. What's the question over your head? I mean, I'm worried about my kid's college education. What's, okay, well, now you're with four guys and you just opened up about everything else. And then a guy can go, hey, are you open to some feedback, some help? I mean, we're here not just to you know, talk. We want to go through life together. So those five questions, I use those all the time because it just lets everyone be on the same page. Y'all just spin cycle, between the two of you, you just spin cycled my brain. <laughs> I had this salient point I was going to make. And you guys, just listen, you guys created 10 more salient points. And I think I lost a few of them. I'm, Ted, next time I'm gonna have to keep a book and write notes as everybody's speaking. Before I forget, so Ted, I hope you invite him back for a part two and really dig into the conversation with your spouse or significant other, because it's not the same conversation, it's not. So I'll leave that there, that's awesome. Um, part of what everyone said though, is men were fixers. Hold true to yourself as a man and be a fixer. So when you come to me with a problem, instead of trying to, I'm gonna dip out. No, I'm actually gonna fix it. I'm going to help you fix it. And if you take that mental strategy into, into that point, like when you're talking about it was negative, it was negative. You sit there, instead of sitting there, you know, it's negative, cross your arms and be like, you know what, buddy, We're, I'm gonna help you get through this because I'm gonna help you fix it. It's literally, the, it's just a mental switch, a different way of looking at the same problem um, and this, this conversation, is, just this conversation has helped me immensely. You know, giving and receiving, it's, it's a dual-edged sword. You need to be able to do both. I honestly think majority of the value from this conversation is going to be someone you know, like I know when my buddies are hurting, but we avoid it. It's going to be the, hey man, you know, I, I saw you out with your girl. I can tell, are, are you okay? Uh, you know, or I, you know, I kind of know what's going on where you work. Are you okay? I think that is going to be the big takeaway. It's don't, don't just worry about your problems. If you can help start helping others and those avenues will open up. So when you're, when you have a problem, you've got a million places to take it. I think. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I was just, I was just going to, yeah. and, and this is the last thing I, I think five's a lot, sure. but like if, if you just had the high and low, yeah, just pick. and you just like incorporated that into every time that you met with someone, you're like, hey man, tell me about the, the, yeah, yeah, the highest high and the lowest low in the last couple yeah, of weeks. Like we just started with that. Yeah. Right. Like if you started that with every single person that you came in contact with, whether mm -hmm. you know them a, knew them a ton, or whether you're just getting to, getting to know them, if you just started with that, imagine the conversation that would be created out of that. And imagine the connections, deeper connections that would be made with people just by giving them the opportunity to express the lows and the highs yeah. and then kind of just seeing where that, that goes. That's uh, that, just those two my, by itself, I think are powerful. Yeah, and, and like, you're exactly right. Asking five questions right off the bat is a lot. But if you're the leader going in and not your group of friends said, well, they're the leader, but like you're just saying, hey, I'm gonna take responsibility for the temperature of this room and how it goes, I'm just gonna ask everyone what's the biggest thing they're learning right now. Like get that conversation going, it'll be fine, like it will move and then you just do that each time, it, it's really amazing. Man, Jonathan, thank you. You thank definitely you, will be coming Stop. back. We have a lot more to dive <laughs> into. Uh, for all the men out there, be a leader, be a modern man and next time you're having a conversation with a friend, just take the lead and ask them what they're dealing with. As I think what we all talked about was, we all have emotions, we're all going through something so as a man, be the leader and ask someone else what that is. Allow them to share before you share your own load and open up the vulnerability and just see what happens. That's just one step towards a solution. We'll continue to search for more. Go out there and be a modern man. <laughs>